when God rises up, part 6, Job chapter 31 and verses 29 to 34. We have three thoughts for tonight. The 10th, 11th and the 12th. Sought indictment for being vindictive towards enemy. Verse 29 to 30. Sought indictment for not extending hospitality to strangers. Verse 31 to 32. Sought indictment for hypocrisy, for hiding his sins. Verses 33 to 34. The first thought. Sought indictment for being vindictive towards enemy. Job up to now has been testifying concerning his life before God and before men. He said in verse 29, If I rejoice at the destruction of him that hated me, or lifted up myself when evil found him, neither have I suffered my mouth to sin by wishing a curse to his soul. The clear teaching of God's word adhered to by Job in Proverbs 24, verses 17 to 18. Explained quite clearly here. Rejoice not when the, thine enemy falleth. Let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. Lest the Lord see it, and it displease him, and he turn away his wrath from him. Likewise, our Lord Jesus instructed us the godly way when he said, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. The life of the Christian, the Lord seeks for us to learn how to bear the yoke of sin in a depraved and very fallen world. Job understood himself the displeasure toward the untruth of God's displeasure towards the untruthful person. He says in Job 17, verse 5, which you recall, He that speaketh flattery to his friends, even the eyes of his children shall fail. He realized that God sees all that we do, and God wants his people to learn to commit injustice that they suffer into his hands. The Lord says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. And so for the people of God, it is not that we suffer in silence. Uh, indeed, we suffer, but we commit our ways to God. Peter says in 1 Peter 4.19, the spiritual mindset that Job possesses, which he testifies, and God wants us to possess and have. First Peter 4, 9 says, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing, as unto a faithful Creator. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God. If you are suffering because you have not done anything that is contrary to God's word, then your conscience does not rebuke you and you realise that this suffering is, can be great, inflicted on you, uh, as we said, commit it to the Lord. Just like the widow who went to the unjust judge to seek redress for her grievances. Right? Our Lord Jesus says, <coughs> uh, men ought to pray uh, and not to faint. Men ought 
to pray and not to, to faint. So the widow was without redress. She was weak. She was unable to vindicate herself. The powerful persecutors or oppressors um, were too, too overwhelming. So she had to go to the unjust judge. That's in Luke chapter 18. And the Lord wants us to see and learn right, how she was persistent. And the Lord says to, says to us that you have a Father in heaven who would, when you ask good things, or when you ask Him, would He not hear you? Of course, your Father is not unjust. Even the unjust judge would answer you. I have been, he has been, uh, in that sense, uh, the, woman, the widow keep going to him, pleading uh, for his, uh, for his uh, intervention. Uh, finally, he relented. What more our Father in heaven who loves us and who is the most just of all judges, will he not help? And so here, Peter tells us that if you are suffering, then commit your soul to the Lord in well-doing. In other words, do not return eye for eye, tooth for a tooth, tit for tat. The psalmist likewise articulated well that we must not rejoice at the calamity of others who may not have treated us well. Psalm 35, verses 13 to 14 says, But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth, I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer returned into my own bosom. I behaved myself as though he had been my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one that mourneth for his mother. Psalm 35, verses 25 to 26. Let not them that say in their hearts, Ah, so would we have it. Let them not say we have swallowed him up. Let them not be ashamed and brought to confusion together that rejoice at my hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonour that magnify themselves against me. If you remember the story of Haman in the book of Esther, he was a wicked man. He wanted the, to have the Jews all incarcerated because there was one Jew who refused to bow to him. That was a man called Mordecai. And he built a gallow, very big gallow, for the head of Mordecai to hang him. And he instigated the king to pass a decree to kill not only Mordecai, but all the Jews in the land of Persia. So it was, there was a great cry that went on. And what happened? Well, Mordecai said to Esther, let us, would you go to the king? He has raised you up, perhaps, for such a time as this. And so Esther called for a fast to pray for three days. All who have known the matter. And so they fasted, and she went in to the king. And lo and behold, the Lord overturned the matter. And the gallow that Haman built for Mordecai was used to hang himself. It's as if the stone that he rolled, rolled back upon him. We said boomerang. Ah. And so here, the Lord says that we have a God who has made us a faithful creator, who make us perfect, under his care, sovereignly he watches over us 
And you know, our God is so good. He takes care of us so well. Uh, and the psalmist in the Psalms mentioned about God's care, God's care for His creation. You read, I think it's Psalm 104, you would be able to see and learn how every part of God's creation is taken care of by God. So great, so good, so wonderful. And man who is made in God's image, is he not concerned? Of course, he's even more concerned. And so, our Lord says that, look at the lilies in the field, look at the plants, the flowers, did not God clothe them? Did God, not God take care of them? Uh, cannot God vindicate? Well, Job trusted God. And that is why he was able to say that he did not rejoice at the destruction of those that hate him. Or did he uh, devise mischief against them? Neither did, did he curse them. So this was his testimony towards his foes. And then he sought indictment for not extending hospitality to strangers. Uh, he was someone who uh, took care of even strangers who come by his house and here is described in verse 31 and 32. If the men of my tabernacle said not, Oh, that we, have, we had of his flesh, we cannot be satisfied. Right? The people who stay with him uh, uh, were partakers of the good that is in his house. And were they not satisfied? Job said, they, they are satisfied. Could anyone say they were not satisfied? There was none. The stranger did not lodge in the street, but I opened my doors to the traveller. Job was a man given to hospitality. He opens his house to guests who would lodge with him. He was given to hospitality. 1 Peter 4 verse 9 and 10. Peter says, use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received a gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Isaiah 58 verse 7. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him? And that thou hide not thyself from thy own flesh. Well, the Lord exhorts us to have a compassionate heart, to extend help to those in need. In the parable, <clears throat> our Lord Jesus uh, exhorts us to do good, extending hospitality to others. This Job did. Matthew chapter 25, verses 34 to 40. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, or fed thee, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. So you see, the doctrine of God 
the goodness of God, the benevolent heart of God, the compassionate heart of God is played out for us and the Lord wants us to see and joke, exemplify such a conduct. And he was ready to give testimony of what God had done for him. And indeed, this must be also the doctrine in which we live by. Uh, Jesus tells us that there is reward awaiting. When we expand, when we cast our bread into the waters, well, it will return to us. And so the Lord is saying to us here, the teaching us the, uh, the goodness of the doctrine of sowing and reaping. When we sow good, good will return to us. And Job was one who was not, right, was not uh, uh, withholding, but he was uh, truly opening his doors even to the traveller. And we thank the Lord that he sets for us such a good example. The Bible provides for us uh, the example of a godly man, man who fear God and hate evil, and a man who does good. And when God gives us this such uh, great uh, insight to the heart of God, right? here when we speak about what Job is doing, right, he's putting on the character of God. who God is, you see. And that is comforting, right? That indeed, the Spirit of God can transform a man and that such goodness can come to us and such goodness can be imparted through us. Of course, if we have not experienced the goodness of God, we cannot say how we can extend such goodness. But if we have experienced the goodness of God, then we are able to say that we can, by the grace of God, extend such goodness to the people around us. So the two thoughts we have seen uh, now the last one. Sought indictment for hypocrisy, for hiding his sins. Verse 33 to 34. If I covered my transgression as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom, did I fear a great multitude or did the contempt of families terrify me that I kept silence or went out of the door? He says that he is someone who live a life of transparency. Adam, he cited the example, hid from the presence of God after he disobeyed God to partake the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said to him, don't eat of it. For the day that thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. To die, you shall die. You shall emphatically die. The consequence of sin. Yeah. Genesis 3, verse 7 to 11 described for us. And the eyes of them were both opened when they took of the fruit and they knew that they were naked and they sow fig, tree, fig leaves together and made themselves aprons and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. So, you know, the paradise is a wonderful place. Right? Uh, it's not uh, humid and hot. 
but it's cool. The environment is very pleasant. God gave them such a beautiful environment, such a pleasant environment for them to live. There was no sin. Uh, and as long as they would obey the Lord, they would be able to continue in the paradise. And yet, they failed. And Job said that he was not as Adam who covered his iniquity, his transgressions. Right? Uh, in the garden, this was what happened. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. I hid myself. Sin causes shame. The sinner hides his guilt and fears to be exposed. Fears to be exposed. God had to confront Adam to jot him to admit his sin and to deal with his sin. There were grave consequences to sin. Adam could not hide from God. God had already said to him, the consequence. Unto the woman, the Lord said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. So sorrow came to men. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and has eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken. For thus thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And so God meted out the punishment. And it's not just for Adam, but for his posterity. And we, living in our time, are feeling that same curse that God uh, effected upon humankind right? in childbirth. It's so clear, and we see how um, we have to sweat it out in our work so that we may be able to eat our bread. And thorns and thistles, uh, they are competing weeds in the garden <laughs> to... Uh, to a fruitful harvest. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat thy bread. And then what happens? And thou shalt return unto the ground. In other words, we will disintegrate, we will decompose, we will perish. Well, Adam and Eve was not created for destruction. In fact, we are not created for that. In fact, God created us with a good intention to prosper us. And Job has experienced that prosperity that God gave to him and that prosperity cannot be articulated right, by uh, his possessions by what he has, but by his position before God, that he was always one who walked with God, walked close to God, and lived a life of righteousness in the fear of God. When God pronounced the curse, God also provided the remedy. Right. Genesis 3.21 
Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them, prefiguring Christ, the Lamb of God that will take away the sins of the world. Thank God there is a way out and God has provided that way out for us and it is for us to take hold of it and it's for us to propagate that remedy, that hope that God has provided for the curse of sin, for eternal damnation, for, for eternal death. God has provided that solution and Job has appropriated it. That is why he was able to, by the grace of God, by the power of the Spirit of God in him, do the good, love the commandments, worship God according to His ways, not our own ways. Like the psalmist Job lived in his integrity. He was true to his confession and faith. Are we true to our confession and faith? The psalmist says in Psalm 26 verse 1, Judge me, O God. O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord. Therefore, I shall not slight. You realize the stability of a man who's under, who is undergirded by God Himself. He has no other sufficiency but only in God. And all others he denounced. And so the psalmist says, Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. For thy loving kindness is before me, and I have walked in thy truth. You see, if you have experienced the goodness of God, and God uses the good to energize us, to see how gracious he is, and should we not feel grateful for what He has done for us? And should we not uh, make a good choice, make a choice to follow Him and obey Him, make a choice to walk with Him as Job has done? Um, that walk with God was... Uh, well, was uh, uh, in the sense we said that it, is, it has nothing to do with his external conditions, whether he's in poverty or in wealth. Like we said of the, the true story that Jesus gave of the man Lazarus, right? he was eating crumbs from the rich man's table. And yet, it filled his stomach and he was able to be contented uh, because he understood this was his lot in life. And is it a good lot that God gives to us when we do not have the material things of this life? Well, if we have the Lord with us, let us therewith learn to be content. Let us learn how to be abound and learn how to abase. And this was a lesson that Job had to learn. God brought him through the cycles, the seasons of life. And we have to go through the seasons of life and it tries us, it tries our heart to help us to see if we are true to what we confess, what we profess before God. When we open our Bible to allow the searchlight of God's Word uh, to come upon us as we meditate upon His Word, you will find that we are helped 
God guides us through His Word, showing us where we have erred, how to come back to Him, and the right path to take. And so let us not neglect prayer time, Bible study time, worship time. Let us hold highly the preaching of God's Word the listening of God's Word. And this is God's appointed means for our sanctification. It's God's appointed means for our purification. That we may be made perfect, a man who would be made ready for good works that our life may not be lived in vain. What privilege we have as God's people. Job could testify that life with God is well worth living in the time of deepest calamity. And the Lord wants us to have that kind of assurance in us to know for a fact, to take hold of the promises of God's word for a truth, even though we may not see it or in sight, but we believe it in faith. That's the life with God. And in eternity, there will be no regret. We who have seen by faith the glory to come will live by faith the suffering that may come. We are willing to trust God. We are willing to uh, obey Him and follow Him and not renounce Him, whether in wealth or in poverty. Right? They are, it, it is a common saying that if it's poverty, don't include me. I don't want to live in that state of poverty. But our Lord Jesus lived in that state of poverty when He was on earth, but He was the richest man on earth. Right? He told the man who came to Him, He says, you truly want to follow Me? I do not have uh, a pillow to, for my head in the night. You truly want to follow Me? Would you want to follow, live such a life? Well, Jesus is saying that we must count our cost and realize that this life of faith involves, requires that we would trust Him, that we may see His glory. And suffering can come Calamity can come, uh, come what may, the Lord will not forsake us. And this will be the lesson that Job would learn. You would see that he would soon conclude all his speeches. He closed his case. Enough said. Enough heard. How precious we are in God's sight. We are given the Spirit of God to guide us to follow His Word. Let us be willing to follow Him. Amen.